Good morning. Welcome, old friends and new friends. We are so glad to be in worship with you again this Sunday. We want to know you. We're especially glad if you are a first-time guest with us today. Part of uh, being a guest is wanting to feel at home and like you know what's going on. So if you have any questions, we hope you'll ask one of our ushers or one of your neighbors so that you'll get in the loop on, on what's going on around here. And part of feeling at home is doing a little bit of housekeeping. So we want to make sure that you know a couple of things. First is that in your bulletin, in the perforated part is a connection card. That is your attendance card. So if you will tear that off, you can fill that out. And when the offering plates are passed later in the service, you can drop those in the offering plate as part of your offering, as a sign that you are here. Your presence is a gift to us for sure. The other thing we wanna make sure you know is that if today is the day that you would like to make your presence here more permanent and join our church and membership, there are these how to join very tall cards in the back of the pews. You can fill one of those out and bring it forward at the uh, end of the service during the final hymn. And I believe that is all we have. It really is a rainy and chilly day today. It is wonderful to be in this sanctuary together, feel, feeling the warmth of each other and the warmth of God's spirit. It is truly a pleasure. So if you will, please remain seated as we prepare our hearts for this worship.
remain standing and turn back in your bulletin as we affirm our faith together. We belong to God, creator of all that is and all that is to come, abundant provider of the gifts in this life and the gifts in our own hearts. It is God alone who gives life, who is generous beyond measure with grace and blessing. We follow Christ, whom God sent to teach and heal, to show us a new way of living, with love and trust and courage, with joy and generosity. In his faith, Jesus gave of himself, even his very life. He was crucified and buried, yet God raised him from death, and he lives among us and grants his spirit to us. We live by that Holy Spirit and entrust ourselves to its guidance and empowerment. As members of the church, the body of Christ, we devote ourselves to lives of love, rejoicing in the power of forgiveness, the reality of resurrection, and the mystery of life eternal. Amen. begin this day with adoration. We adore your son who is love, whose nature is compassion, whose presence is joy, whose word is truth, whose spirit is goodness, whose holiness is beauty, and whose will is peace. In this hour, may we adore you and glorify you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. It is always a joy and a sacred time in the life of our church and in the life of a family when we baptize one of our little ones. And so this morning I ask Britton and John Brender to please bring their son forward for baptism. These receiving the, rec the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which pri holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And will you nurture Robert Russell and Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. We will. Hi, come see me. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> 
about that. It's fuzzy, isn't it? <laughs> I wish you could see the smile on his face. It's <laughs> wonderful. Robert Russell, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now if you'll place your hands on him also, please. Robert Russell, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn around and smile at your church family. What a blessing it is to participate in this wonderful and holy sacrament of baptism and to pledge ourselves to uh, help nurture and care for uh, Bobby, uh, for Robert Russell, as he grows up among us. Hey, friends, look at your new, your new brother in the church. Yeah, yeah, this is your brother in Christ. What a blessing it is to, um, to participate in that and to, uh, along with his parents, to pledge that we will give of ourselves to do all that we can uh, to uh, help him grow up in, in faith. And someday he'll stand at this or some other altar and make his own profession of faith in Christ, and this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. <laughs> is he giving you a smile? Yeah, it's good. He's a happy guy. Lamar, will you lead everyone in the response? There is in your bulletin a response, and I forgot my bulletin. You can take mine right there if you'd like. Thank you. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Robert Russell, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. like to invite the children to come down for our time together. Kids, come on. We're going to do our children's message today a little bit backwards. We're actually going to start with a prayer today. So repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful rain. Amen. All right. Now, congregation, today is the first day our three-year-olds are with us. They wait and come in the spring. So let's all wave and say hi to our three-year-olds and make them feel nice and welcome. Yeah. Sometimes just having that one friendly face really helps. That's a bunch of friendly faces. Well, good morning. You know, one of my real heroes, Mr. Rogers, says that there are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to show how much we care. And when it comes to loving God, there are lots of ways that we can show our love for God, like praying, like we just did a second ago. Another way we can show our love for God is being kind to each other. So very gently, I want you to pat a neighbor on the back and say, hey, friend. Go ahead, say, hey, friend, very gently, I'm glad you're here. 
pat another neighbor on the back, say, hey, friend, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, being kind to each other is a really good way to show God how much we love God. Another way is to sing. Did y'all see the baptism with the baby? What was the song that we all sang? Jesus loves me, right? Let's sing the chorus of that all together. So the yes, Jesus loves me right there. Here we go. And yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. There's so many ways to say I love you, but you know, here's one I think we sometimes forget. When you really want someone you love to know that you love them, can't you just say the words, I love you? But we forget to do that with God. So we, we show our love for God. We go do all these nice things for God. We say thank you to God, and we ask God for help. We ask God for comfort. We ask God for assurance. We ask God to put the dressing on the side. We do all of those things. But sometimes I think we forget to say how much we love God. Do you, real, do you believe in God? Do you believe God is real? Oh yeah, right? God is real and that God loves you very much and that God is more than just kind of general niceness in the world, but there really is a God who loves you very much and cares for you. Then why would we not turn to God every once in a while and stop and say, I love you, God. It's an easy thing to do. Let's all stop and let's practice it. Let's say it. Say, I love you, God. Oh, you know that makes God smile. Let's whisper it. Say, I love you, God. Let's say it at the top of our lungs. I love you, God. And we can even sing it. We can sing, yes, God, I love you. Let's sing that. Yes, God, I love you. There's so many ways to say I love you. So for the one who loves us so much, every once in a while, let's make sure we stop and say, I love you to God. One more time, I love you, God. Oh, and God loves you. Amen. Have a great day. pray. God, in wisdom, you teach us your way and call us to follow you. Help us to trust you in all things. Then we will be at peace knowing that you do what is best. May these gifts extend your peace in our community and to the ends of the earth. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.
I uh, want to add my welcome to you. It's so good to see you all this morning. And uh, I think about uh, something that, a conversation I had with our oldest daughter when she was about two and a half or, or, uh, or so. Uh, we were driving along. It was a day like today. It was, you know, misting rain and cold. And I said to her, what a yucky day. And she said, Daddy, God made today and you shouldn't call it yucky. So out of the mouths of babes, and whenever I want to say, what a yucky day, I remember the wisdom of, the, of, uh, of my daughter. And it's, it's tough, isn't it, when your own teaching gets back to you in that way? Uh, but uh, it's also really wonderful, too. Well, it, it's um, a blessing to have um, speaking to us this morning, Roger Partridge, who will come and share with us. Roger is our director of stewardship on our staff. He came on the staff a year ago this past, or, or, or a year ago this coming May, and um, is directing the uh, stewardship giving activities of, uh, of our church. And he is such a blessing. I, am, I would not be surprised if everyone in the room said, oh yeah, we've met Roger. He was involved in, in this a program or in that class, or I was at this event and there he was, and he was helping uh, people cross the street at VBS and on and on. Roger uh, has come as close to mastering omnipresence uh, as uh, anybody I know, and, uh, and what a gift to our uh, church. And he comes uh, to share with us this morning about our stewardship campaign. Roger, thank you. Good morning. I want to add my welcome to you this morning. It's good to be with you. I want to express my gratitude to the congregation for the inspiring response to our end of year giving. We started December with a $900,000 deficit to raise, a $900,000 deficit to raise. And although I can't give you an exact number, as we still have some outstanding invoices to pay and some accounting work to do, we came very, very close to meeting our budget goal. On one of my emails in December, I talked about a top 10 list for our church. The list has grown to the top 12. My good friend, Dr. Lamar Smith, reminded me that we welcomed over 250 new members to our congregation in 2014. That is an outstanding number, an extraordinary number. Your end of your contributions is on the list too. Thank you for your response. But that was last year. We are about to begin our stewardship focus for 2015. This is why we give. Over the next few weeks, we'll focus on our church byline, love God, serve people, transform lives. Throughout this campaign, which is short and intense by design in order to get this important job done, before the beginning of Lent, you're going to hear progress reports of the dollars committed toward our goal and the percentage completed as we raise what we need to embark on a new year of living out our mission as a church. I believe our relationship with and how we honor God is why we give. As a Christian, our love is expressed through our discipline of giving. We bring our tithes and our gifts as an expression of that love. Last year, only one-third of our congregation made a commitment to the ministry budget of our church. In November, when we first talked about the stewardship program, our staff committed that they would commit 100% to complete a pledge for 2015. I'm very happy to announce that your staff has made that commitment. There are several staff that aren't members here, but made a pledge because they believe in the ongoing ministries of this church. I challenge you to be a part of our 100% Club. Our church committee leadership are well on their way to being the next 100% Club. Will you join us? Is it your Sunday school class, your Bible study group, your volunteer group, whatever small group you are associated with, please join with them and make a commitment for 2015. Just pick a percentage and make a commitment. The ushers will have cards as you leave today. There are cards on the pew back in front of you you can always complete a pledge online at the church website. Please contact me if you have questions or need assistance. I'm happy to help and always happy to visit. I look forward to seeing you in worship throughout 2015. Thank you for your commitment to God and to this wonderful church.
O Lord, we have searched, you have searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I stand up, even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. so high above me that I can't Where could I go to flee from your spirit? Where could I go to escape your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed ashore, you are there as well. If I could fly on the wings of dawn, stopping to rest only on the far side of the ocean, even there your hand would lead me, even there your strong hand. If I said, the darkness will definitely hide me, the light will become night around me, even then the darkness isn't too dark for you. Nighttime will shine away, for darkness is the same as light to you. God who is love. How we struggle to try to understand how profound that statement is. That you, creator of all that is and all that has been, that you should love us is truly beyond our comprehension. We hardly understand love at all. We struggle to offer love even to those who make it easy, much less those who do not. We are more apt to live our lives out of fear than out of love. We fear for our future and our well-being. We fear those who are different, who might cause us to be inconvenienced or challenged. We fear loss of status, loss of control, loss of security. Yet you love us, and you ask us to love in return. Your love for us is complete and permeates every aspect of our being. There is no human experience that is beyond your reach, whether it is in great suffering or in great joy. You are there. And so as we see all that portends pain and suffering in the world, as the voices of hatred and violence taunt us and fill us with terror, as we live with uncertainty, we pray that you would teach us to love you more. Help us to love you so completely that our fear is diminished and our lives are lived with the confidence of hope. So take our lives and all that we are, all that we have, and let us give an offering of love to you and to this world. Let us be generous with all that we have, that love might prevail in this often unloved and unloving world. 
For we ask this through the one whose demonstration of love was profound and whose only commandment for his followers was that we love one another. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And uh, I invite you, if you'd like, to follow along as I read. It's 1 John 4, 7 through 21. Dear friends, let us love each other because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us this way, we also ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us and God's love is made perfect in us. This is how we know we remain in him and he remains in us because God has given us a measure of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If any of us confess that Jesus is God's Son, God remains in us and we remain in God. We have known and have believed the love of God, the love that God has for us. God is love. Those who remain in love remain in God, and God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us, so that we can have confidence on the judgment day, because we are exactly the same as God in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid has not been made perfect in love. We love because God first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates a brother or sister, that one is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be, who can be seen can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him. Those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. God speaks to us in the reading of Scripture. <clears throat> well, this morning as we begin a series, we are looking at the tagline of our church in relation to our stewardship, our stewardship of who we are and what we have and as we're moving into this, I think about um, Thoreau's words about the disciplined life. Thoreau said, life is diminished by details. Simplicity, 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 he wrote. He said, let your affairs be two or three, not a hundred or a thousand, a mi not a million, but count half a dozen, he wrote. He spoke of simplicity 
Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. And that's the key to the disciplined life, he said. But what does it mean? In fact, we find ourselves yearning, don't we, for a simple life, and we want things to be simple, and yet we know that life is complicated and it's complex, and it has a lot of moving parts, and it can be very difficult. And so what does it mean when we talk about simplicity? I think Oliver Wendell Holmes really pointed in a, a helpful direction on this. Um, because as he talked about simplicity, he said, he wrote, uh, I wouldn't give a fig for the kind of simplicity that exists this side of complexity, but I would give the whole world for the kind of simplicity that exists on the other side of complexity. And what's he saying? He's not talking about being simplistic. Simplistic is the kind of simplicity that exists on this side of complexity. It's, it's the kind of simplicity that hasn't gone through the complexity of life, that hasn't dealt with the, all the moving pieces, that haven't, hasn't faced the fact that life is complicated. There's complexity. Things really are not very simple. So it's really not worth any much. He wouldn't give a fig for it, but... He said, I would give the whole world for that kind of simplicity that exists on the other side of complexity, that really understands and faces and has gone through the complexities and the complications of life and then comes through that with this kind of simplicity that can really be lived, that can really augment our living. And so that kind of simplicity is what we seek. That's the one that we want. That's the one that's worth so much. When we think about, for example, the mission of our church and what we do together as a faith community, we could list all kinds of things. I mean, Roger's uh, top 10 list and now his top 12 list is just barely scratching the surface. We could talk about all the sorts of things we do as a community of faith here and abroad and everywhere in between. But here's what we do. We try to find that simple way that makes sense and stands up in the face of complexity. And that is, we say in our tagline, love God, serve people, transform lives. Love God, serve people, transform lives. It is, in a way, another way of stating the mission of the United Methodist Church, to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of of the world. Love God, serve people, transform lives. So this morning I want us to take that very simple two-word sentence, love God, love God. We enable the, God to be loved in our own lives and in the life of our community of faith. We enable the love of God in many ways, and one of those ways is in our giving. Love God. But what does it mean when we say love God? Love is one of those words that we could say is complicated, it's complex. It, it is because we use that word in so many different ways. It is a word that, as many of our words uh, have experienced, it's a word that has experienced meaning creep over time. That is to say, we use the word in all sorts of ways so it doesn't have quite the meaning that it once had. I was thinking about this. There are lots of candidates for this. One is, one is uh, the way we use hyperbole now. Have you thought about that? When we really want to express something and sort of push it beyond the normal and express that this is something extraordinary. I was thinking about the use of the term 100%. Now, 25 years ago, if you wanted to express that you were giving everything, that you were giving all you had, you would say, I'm giving this 100%. And we might say that the team was giving it 100%. Or the quarterback was, was giving it 100%. Or we might say, I am 100% behind this. 
But before long, that wasn't enough. It had to be 110%. It's not even possible. I mean, 100% is as good as you can get, but no, it had to be 110 And then it's 120%. And then I'm giving this 130%, and pretty soon the team was giving it 200%. And I am 300% behind this. And then I'm 1,000% convinced, you know? So now, if you said, are you working on this? And I said, I'm giving it 100%. You'd say, what's the matter with you? You, know, you don't care about it? You're, can't you do better than that? Because of this sort of creep in the meaning where it becomes almost meaningless. And it's kind of that way with the word love, isn't it? I mean, we love everything. We love our sports team. We love the Cowboys. At least right now, we'll see. Uh, we, we, we love pizza. Uh, we, we love our car. I mean, love. But we also say, you know, I love my wife. We also say, I love God and I love my children. And, and it's that same word. So what do we mean? Well, let's make it simple. Let's have that simplicity that is on the other side of complexity. And First John does this for us. First John says very simply, God is love. God is love love. And that's a pretty profound statement. Because by saying that, what he is saying is that the definition of love, which can be used in all sorts of ways, comes from God. The definition of love comes from God, what God is like. And we know what God is like because God is revealed to us in Jesus. So the kind of love we're talking about, the love of God, God is love, is self-giving love. It's caring love. It is unconditional love. That's love. God is love. It's a very simple statement that we have from 1 John. So what does it mean to love God? Jesus gives us another simple statement, a statement that is in that uh, category of simplicity on the other side of complexity. Somebody asked him the question, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second commandment is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Simple. And yet, it is not a statement that ignores the complexities and the complications of life. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength means love God with, with, what, with, with your passion, what you are passionate about. Love God passionately with all your heart, with your soul, with the essence of who you are who you uniquely are. Love God with your mind. So important. So important because there is this notion out there that uh, in order to really love God, we have to set aside our capacity to reason and to think. We have to set aside the base of knowledge that we have from all the fields of inquiry. But no. We're called to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, with all of our abilities, with our ability to act, with the influence that we have, with the resources that we have. All of that together is our strength. We love God with all that we have and all that we are. That's love. Sometimes when we speak of loving God, though, we, we say it, but we say it in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, get, get demonstrated. You know? It's like the guy that wrote the letter uh, to his girlfriend. You have probably heard this. He, he wrote, Dear Jane, um, I love you more than anything. I, I, I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would, 
I would crawl through the deepest valley. I would swim the greatest ocean. I would fight the fiercest battle. That's how much I love you. Love, John. P.S. I'll be over Saturday if it doesn't rain. <laughs> it's as though we sometimes say to God, yes, I made a vow that I would love you and that I would uphold the church with prayers and presence and gifts and service and witness. And I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll pray occasionally. And, well, I'll show up sometimes. And if there's anything left over, I'll give. And I'll serve if, you know, at some point I can find the time. And I'll witness. I'll, you know, sometimes I'll intentionally live the life that I profess. But see, this call to love God is put very simply in these words from 1 John a little uh, in the words of 1 John a little earlier in the third chapter when 1 John says uh, friends let us love not in speech and words but in truth and action uh, that's how we're called to love he even says in the verse just before that, if you see a brother or sister in need and you have the goods of this world and you do not care, then you do not love God. We love God in part by loving others. We love God with all that we have and all that we are. That's how we love God. It's really quite simple. It's, it's the simplicity that's on the other side of, of complexity, I think. In the midst of all the complexities of life, it's a simple sentence, but profound in the way it impacts our world and our own lives and everyone around us love God. Love God. One of the things that stands in the way of loving, and perhaps our greatest stumbling block, and the emotion that can be so corrosive in our relationships and so corrosive in our ability to act when we need to act and to speak up when we need to speak up, to stand up when we need to stand up, and to do what God calls us to do, it's fear. It's fear. If you think about it, what is it that causes so much trouble in our world? What is it that causes us to distrust one another? What is it that causes us to strike out at one another? What is it that causes us when we know that God is calling us to do a big thing, whether it's as a congregation or as an individual, what is it that causes us not to act in love, fear? And again, very simply, with utter simplicity, 1 John says, perfect love, and that's a good word, perfect. It, it can also be translated mature, whole, complete. Perfect love casts out, drives out fear. Complete, whole, mature love drives out fear. It sets aside that which would keep us from doing that which is most important and from being who God calls us to be. But perfect love. The love God has for us and the love that we have for God, mature, whole, complete love, drives that fear from us, from our faith community, from our larger community, so that we can be God's people in the world. In just a moment, we will close our service as we always do with a responsive benediction. But I want to call your attention uh, in your bulletin that it's different today. Instead of the response being, we will go out to be God's people in the world. 
as is our tradition here, we will name in that response with a little more detail what it means to be God's people in the world. With those three simple sentences, love God, serve people, transform lives. Amen. Well, I want to tell you why I love our church a bajillion percent. It is, it was modeled this morning for me. Uh, a couple of our sixth graders I see very regularly in the front office, and they always have donuts, and I am very easily tempted by donuts. And I told them one Sunday that they should always share with me, and so very regularly I receive donuts from them, which is really nice. But at the turn of the new year, I flipped the script on them and told one of them that I needed them to hold me accountable and to not eat the donuts because I'm gonna get myself in order and eat better. So this morning I walked into my office and I had a donut sitting on my desk, and there was a note that said, uh, from your friendly neighborhood Parker. And then below that it said, don't eat this, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful represent, representation of, of the church at work in our sixth graders, both in generosity and in accountability. Uh, I love the people who are here among me. I am, I am grateful to walk this journey in love with all of you. And I hope that you find that this is a place that you find generosity and accountability at work among many other beautiful things, a place where you are growing in love with God. So if this is the Sunday that you would like to join your membership with this congregation during the singing of our final hymn, you can meet Dr. Brewster and Dr. Smith at the, at the front rail, and we would love to receive you in membership this morning. But if you will now stand and sing our closing hymn, hymn number 557, Bless Me the Tithe of Wines. first service this morning, the daughter and the family, Erin, went through our confirmation class last year and was baptized and received into the church. And she started asking her parents, why didn't they come to church too? Well, it's taken Erin a while, but she finally got them to the altar this morning and they all came and became members of our church family. So when you meet the Howells, Dawn and Mike, you welcome them into our church family. Thank you, Lamar. Let me remind you that the response is in your bulletin that we'll use this morning and it's different from the one that we traditionally use. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. 
Amen.